thank you, fellas, for that reminder of all that we have to be thankful for. We are returning this morning to our series, Understanding the Times. And we've been in this series of messages looking at the end times for several weeks now. And let me just kind of remind us, the fellows will put up on the screen the uh, timeline uh, that we're working on. We, you and I, are living right now in the church age. The next event on the calendar is the rapture of the church. The Lord Jesus comes in the clouds. We go up to meet him. When that happens, it begins on this earth a period of seven years of great tribulation. And while that is going on, two things happen in heaven. Number one is the judgment seat of Christ. Number two is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then that all comes to an end here on earth with the revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes back to the earth, riding on white horses, all the saints of the ages riding with him. The battle of Armageddon is fought and uh, it begins a period that we looked at our last time, the week before Easter, we know as the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And so that brings us to the next event on God's prophetic calendar. That next event is the great white throne judgment. And so I invite your attention, please, to the book of the Revelation again this morning. And we're in the 20th chapter of the book of the Revelation here. We looked at this chapter two weeks ago as we looked at the millennium together. And uh, we'll close out the last five verses of chapter 20 this morning in the book of the Revelation. So if you are able to stand, I invite you to stand with us for the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter number 20 and uh, begin reading in verse number 11. John, under inspiration of God's spirit, writes these words, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, we are so very grateful this morning that you have laid out for us the clear warnings in your word. You, you have clearly declared that there is a judgment day coming. You've clearly made it known not only in the scriptures, but I believe even in the conscience of every person that we have an accountability to you, the great God of heaven. And so I pray today that if there's anyone in this room that does not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior, I pray today they will flee this wrath that is to come upon them if they do not trust him. And I pray for those of us who are saved, Lord, Lord, may you today give us a greater compassion and a greater passion to get the gospel to our friends and family members and our neighbors and co-workers and even to the ends of the earth. Lord, today, would you use your word in our lives, individually and corporately. I ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. 
Without a doubt, we come this morning to the most solemn, serious, somber passage in the Scriptures. T today we come to this clear description of a coming judgment. Over and again in the Bible, God has declared this day. Even in the Old Testament, I think of the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 as Solomon finishes out that sermon in verse 14. He says, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. The writer of Hebrews wrote in chapter 9 and verse 27, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. He write again in chapter 10 and verse 31 of Hebrews, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The judgment that we examine together this morning is a judgment for every sinner who never received Jesus as their Savior. The Lord's people will not be judged there. We will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. But lost people will be judged there. I'm thankful this morning that as a Christian, I'll not appear before the great white throne judgment. I settled out of court March the 15th, 1970, when I took Jesus to be my advocate to the Father. And he represents me this morning. His righteousness is mine through faith. I love that verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 8. I'm in chapter number 8 and verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. See, God has written the certainty of judgment into the conscience of every person. I believe every person on this planet, whether they know little or a lot about God, know that they have accountability to someone or something greater than they are. They understand that in the end, right and righteousness will prevail. Famous sermon preached. If you've never heard it, I'd recommend you Google it and listen to it this week. But Dr. R.G. Lee, the longtime pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, the title of it is Payday Someday. And before Dr. Lee was ever the pastor at Bellevue, he was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in New Orleans, Louisiana. And he tells in that sermon an opportunity he had to talk with a lady on death row in the Louisiana State Women's Penitentiary and try to share with her the gospel she rejected the gospel, and her name, he only gives her name as Tony Joe. Best I remember, I was going back to listen to the message, but I never did. But I remember him calling her Tony Joe. And he, he said that this is a statement, Tony Joe, is, of course, every capital punishment person gets to make a statement. This is a statement that Tony Joe made not long before her death. I somehow always understood that God was running the show. I just thought I could steal one act. Friend, nobody is going to escape the judgment of God who rejects Jesus. The three aspects of this Great white throne judgment I want you to look at with me this morning in our text. First of all, I want us to notice the judge. John opens this portion of scripture in verse 11 with these words, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. John 
saw a throne. But he saw more than a throne. He saw a sovereign judge sitting on that throne. Jesus, while he was here on earth, is recorded for us in John chapter 5 and verse 22. He says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. I believe that this judge is none other than Jesus Christ himself because Jesus declared very plainly that it would not be the Father who sits there in judgment, but rather the Son, the one who gave his life, who shed his blood so that he could redeem and rescue every person from this judgment. Listen to me. It is not God's will that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus did not die, friend, so you would spend forever separated from him. Jesus died so that you could spend forever with him. And he will sit there on that throne. It's interesting how this throne is described. If you're familiar at all with the book of the Revelation, you know that the throne is referenced from the very beginning to the very end of this book. And yet here there are two adjectives that are given that are not given in any other place. Those two adjectives are great and white. I believe they're great. it's described as great because of its power, because of its position above all, because of its purpose of judgment. I, I believe that the, the adjective white is used to speak of its purity. It, it is a place where the great judge of the ages will meet out both a right and a righteous judgment. And the verdict that's rendered from this throne will be uncontestable. The verdict that's rendered from this throne will be unchallengeable. The verdict that's rendered from this throne will be undeniable. This judge can't be bought. This judge cannot be bribed. It will be right and forthright. The psalmist said in Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. When John saw this throne, and when John saw him that sat on it, the Lord Jesus Christ, Notice what it says in that next phrase of verse 11. From whom, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. At this point, there's no place to hide. You know, many of us have done things that we thought nobody would ever find out. I have, you have. We thought that surely we did such a good job of hiding it, it could never ever be unearthed. If that's what you're relying on, you will have no place to hide it. From his face, the face of Jesus, all of heaven and earth will flee away. Whatever you thought you were going to hide behind or whatever you thought you were going to stand on other than the righteousness of Jesus Christ at that moment will not be available. It's interesting to me, though, how he states it. It says, from whose face... We won't go back over there, but if you'll write it down or look at it later. Revelation chapter 1, when John first saw Jesus, one of the descriptive phrases he uses in verse 14 is his eyes were as a flame of fire. This very face that many have scorned, mocked, and ridiculed that day will be the face of him with whom they have to deal. And the question in that day will not be, what will you do with Jesus? 
The question in that day will be, what will Jesus do with you? The wonderful reality of the day you and I live in, the church age, as we identified it on the timeline, the day of grace. Look, the wonderful news is today you can choose to receive Jesus as your Redeemer. But if you choose not to do that, you'll meet him that day as your revenger. You can choose today to make your way to the foot of the cross and be born again. Or you can reject him and stand in his courtroom. The Apostle Paul, in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, is preaching to the people in Athens. And he said, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Last Sunday morning, we look together at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5, and we look together at the reality of the hope that is afforded us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But can I just say to every one of us in this room and anybody who's with us online, can I just say to all of us this morning, on this day, the day we're looking at, the day of the great white throne judgment, The resurrection will not be your hope. It, it'll be a haunting reality that you rejected the one who rose from the dead. I believe every person in that courtroom will recognize him. By the nail prints in his hand and his feet and the scar on his side and the print of the crown on his, on his head. See, the the, the resurrection doesn't just speak of a risen Savior. The resurrection also speaks of a righteous sovereign. And every sinner has a date with deity at the great white throne judgment. You see the judge. Second aspect I want you to see of this faithful day, the judged. Verse 12 starts off just like verse 11. First three words are exactly the same. And I saw. What did he see? He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. It's interesting how they are referenced. They are called the dead. Why would they be called the dead if they're standing there in judgment? Because they have already sealed their verdict. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, To those of us that are saved, then you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. The the scripture says that all men without Christ are, are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are already separated from God because they have refused to be reconciled to this point if they're living or if they're already into the into hell itself. They are there not awaiting a verdict, they're only there awaiting the sentence. This is how Jesus said it. Jesus said it, John chapter 3, probably one of the most famous chapters in all the New Testament. Verse number 16 is that's across the back of this auditorium. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But if you just go down two verses later, and it says in verse 18, that he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. In the name of the only begotten Son of God. Everyone who stands at this great white throne judgment is not there for another opportunity to be saved. Not there for another possibility to be born again. Not there. 
with hope. It's hopeless. They're dead. But John not only describes them as dead in verse number 12, he describes them as small and great. What does that mean? That means they'll come from all classes and all categories. The famous bank robber will be there, and the unknown petty thief will appear there. Those whose sins were broadcast far and wide on media will be there. And those that had thought they hid their sins will be there. The blatant Christ rejecter, like Thomas Paine and Robert Ingersoll and Voltaire and Madeleine Murray O'Hare, they'll appear there. The men like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Saddam Hussein and many others will be there. But those we never heard their names will appear there. The self-righteous will come. Those who thought that their own morality could atone for their sins. And yet in that day, Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Listen to me. There's nobody in this room this morning or living on this planet that's good enough to be saved. But the good news is there's not anybody in this room or on this planet that's bad enough and can't be saved. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a pastor. I'm not going to heaven because I've been baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a member of Beacon Baptist Church. I'm not going to heaven for any of those reasons. I'm going only because I settled out of court March the 15th, 1970 and put my faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And I stand before him this morning redeemed. And the good news is you can too. You're living in a day where you can still make the choice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not have to make the choice to reject him and go to hell. You say, well, I'm just going to put it off. I was yesterday out knocking doors and a dear man allowed me the privilege to open my Bible and show him the way of salvation. When I came to the place where he had to make a decision, yes or no. He said, I'm not ready. I called him by name and I said, uh, what makes you think you will be ready? He is honest. He said, I don't know. I said, I said, I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to come back and see you. The lining before the great white throne judgment will be filled with procrastinators. I was planning on getting saved. I was this morning in the book of Acts studying the apostle Paul standing before Agrippa. You know what Agrippa said to Paul after Paul gave his testimony? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. There's a hymn written, gospel song, years ago. Almost, sad, sad, that bitter well, almost, but lost. The religious will symbol there that day. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in thy name? Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? There'll be a lot of Baptists there. Lord, I, I got baptized by immersion, just like your Bible said. There'll be people who've been right here where you're at. I heard Raven preach. That doesn't matter. What matters is, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you put your faith in Him? The dead, small and great, 
We'll stand before God. But we don't just see who's standing. We see the standard. Look at it. The books were open. You can go down to the end of that verse. We'll come back to the middle part there. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. What's the books? We'll keep reading. According to their works. Go, go to the end of verse number 13. And they were judged every man according to their works. You know, a lot of people this morning are depending on their works to get them into heaven. Can I tell you the only way, only place your works get you into are hell. The only only time works are going to be taken into account for eternity's sake is the great white throne judgment. And everyone who stands there is condemned already. And God's got the evidence. God's keeping a record. God knows everything you've ever done. I've ever done. God knows everything you've ever said. I've ever said. God knows everything you've ever thought. And everything I've ever thought. And on this day, the skeletons have come out of the closet. Jesus said, Luke chapter 2, verse 2, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Verse 3, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. I can't do it, but what if I could this morning? What if I could put right up on the screen your life this last seven days? Or or what if we could play an audible recording of everything you've said in the last seven days? Or or what what if I had the ability this morning to produce your thoughts from the last seven days? Wouldn't that be enough to condemn you? It wouldn't be enough to condemn me. But I'm not dependent on my works to get me there. I'm dependent only on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that he made available through his death, burial, and resurrection. The books will be open. And when God opens the books, listen to me, there'll be no discussion. There'll be no debate. There'll be no defense. No, you cannot be saved by works. But you will be judged by your works if you do not receive Jesus. But there in the midst of verse 12, another book was opened. Which is the book of life. It's referenced again in verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life. What's the book of life? I believe it's exhibit A in this courtroom. I believe it's the book of life. Matter of fact, it's called in another place in the next chapter, the Lamb's book of life. I believe it records the name of every child of God. Every person who's born again at the moment of salvation gets their name recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And the honest truth is not one person is going to be separated from God forever for the multiplicity of their sins. It is the sin of not receiving Jesus that will send every person there. But I believe that in eternity there will be greater degrees of punishment for those whose works testify against them. As a matter of fact, I think one of the judgments of the lake of fire and brimstone and hell even today is memory. Jesus in Luke chapter 16 told the story of a rich man and Lazarus. Not a parable. True story. And he says in that story, the rich man begging to get out of hell, Abraham said, son, remember. Remember. That thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, now he is comforted, thou art tormented. It even tells us 
where these people, what places they come from. Look in verse 13. It says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Those buried at sea, they're going to come. Those buried at land, they're going to come. Death and hell is going to deliver up the dead which were in them. Earth will open up its grave, deliver the bodies. Hell will open up its mouth, deliver the souls who died without Jesus Christ. You say, well, pastor, now, what is hell then and what is the lake of fire? Let me just try to explain it to us briefly. I won't go into a long dissertation on here. I believe hell is the place where every condemned person goes at the point of death who do not receive Jesus Christ. I believe there are people in hell this morning crying out. Wanting relief, seeking a release, God's going to give them a temporary release. And they'll come and stand before the judge of the ages. And we'll see it in a minute. Then they'll be cast in the lake of fire. This is the way, best way I know how to explain it to us. Hell is the county penitentiary where you wait trial. The lake of fire is, is the is the state penitentiary or the federal penitentiary where you stay forever. No one will escape that. Every one of them, again, will face their works. So you see the judged. Finally, I want you to see with me the judgment. It is stated so emphatically, without hesitation, in verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The sureness and the certainty of the sentence it's clear not one person standing before the great white throne judgment will have a choice in that day except the lake which burns with fire and brimstone as is described in chapter 21 and verse 8 when you do not make a choice in this life to receive Jesus then you leave God no other choice but eternity separated from him. He calls it there at the end of verse 14, the second death. I referenced a few moments ago, we are dead already in our sins and trespasses, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. But the second death is an eternal separation from God. It is forever settled. On that day, there'll be a judge, but there'll be no jury. On that day, there'll be a prosecution, but there will be no defense. On that day, there will be a sentence, but there will be no appeal process and verse 15 rings out with ominous words and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire The last face that an unbeliever will see will be the face of the one who could have redeemed them. The last voice that an unbeliever will hear will be the voice of the one who could have saved them. Matthew 25, these words came from Jesus' lip in verse 41. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, 
prepared for the devil and his angels. And this one lone sentence closes the scene. Eternity will fill in the rest. Friend, if you're here today without Jesus, don't take another chance. Because the reality is this, you and I are walking on the precipice of eternity. We're walking on a spider web stretched over hell, hoping it holds. If you're here without Jesus, what a tragic mistake. Next Sunday, we're going to look at heaven and all the Bible says in its splendid description. It's interesting to me that that's how God closes out the entire Bible and this book, the book of the Revelation. Why? One reason resounds in my soul this morning. That one reason is God does it because he wants everybody to be with him in heaven forever. You say, what if this is just a fairy tale? Friend, it's not. This morning... If God would open up the mouth of hell and allow us to see in for just one second. And you're here unsaved. You'd flee to Jesus. And if God would allow us who are saved to see, we'd be a little more passionate in our persuading of others. Friend, I take no pleasure in preaching this warning. There's a lot of other subjects in the Bible I would prefer to preach. But in order to be a faithful preacher and a pastor, I need to tell you the truth. You still have an opportunity to make a choice. I've testified already two or three times. I made my choice. March the 15th, 1970, I trusted Jesus Christ who suffered my hell and eternity away from God, separated from the Father himself, crying out from that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he forsook him so he could receive me. So he could receive you. Don't allow Jesus just to be your sovereign, righteous judge. Receive him today as your rescuing Savior. Believe on him. Trust him. And those of us that know him, let's be sure to share the good news of salvation with whoever God gives us an opportunity to do so. There's no sadder statement maybe than verse 15 in all the Bible. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Would you bow your heads with me?